Okay, so welcome to this run through of the multiple choice questions that I've set you. So first, if you've come into this video and you haven't yet done the multiple choice questions that you see over here on the left, then you need to go back, uh, do these questions, there's 20 questions, should take you about half an hour, uh, and then come back to this video, we're gonna go through them and see how you do. Uh, once you've got your um, mark, please just send it to me on Teams or submit it on Teams, in fact, um, and then uh, that'll be it. Okay, so the first question, which of these structures contains RNA but not DNA? So this one is the ribosome, okay? It's the ribosome, so the answer is D. Now that's because, uh, and I want you to annotate like I'm doing here, this contains, uh, contains something called ribosomal RNA, rRNA. Uh, so a lot of the rib ribosomes actually is protein and, and RNA sort of together, working together. And there's something important in there which you do need to know called the 16S RNA, uh, which is part of the ribosome. Uh, which we use when we're looking at phylogeny. We, we can com compare this sequence in various different organisms. These two have DNA. In fact, all three of these have DNA uh, in them. Nucleus, we know that, but mitochondria and chloroplasts also have their own DNA. Okay, on to the next one. Which of the following is the function of the Golgi apparatus? So this one is to make secretory products. So that's when a protein is modified. So after it's been produced in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, it might be sent to the Golgi and modified and then secreted. So endocytosis, you might have been tempted by that one. That's sort of taking, thing, taking things in from outside the cell. And that's not really the Golgi's job. The Golgi's is sending things out. Three. Now this one actually I remember was not in the mind map, so you might this one might be new for you. This is B. So these structures which penetrate the walls of adjacent plant cells, they're called plasmodesmata. So I'll kind of try and draw one over here. So if we have basically a plant cell here, you know, there's maybe the nucleus there, and there's a big old vacuole or whatever there. So there's a one plant cell. And Quite often, adjacent plant cells have these plasmodesmata in between. So um, the plasmodesmata is here. So that sort of allows the flow of solutes and things from one cell to another through this little uh, gap within the uh, cell wall. So in fact, there's you know there's continuous cytoplasm between that. So if I really just draw this accurately. Uh, then you know we can see the cell wall is down here. The junction between the two cell walls is in fact, is in fact called the middle lamellae. Uh, something else, a bit of extra detail on plant cell structure. So let's add that in fact. So the first thing we can label, you can do this on your mind map if you'd like, or you do this on this sheet here, is the middle lamella. And it's kind of where the plant cells are glued together. It's almost like uh, bricks glued together with mortar. Uh, except in plant cells, that mortar uh, is um, contains stuff like pectin. I don't know if anyone ever has ever tried to make jam. Then pectin is a, is a sticky substance that goes into jam, and we get it because it's the glue that holds plant cells together. Uh, and then this thing here is the plasmodesmata, this little uh, path. Okay, so on to the next question. Question four. Cells and culture will absorb amino acids from the surrounding medium. So if you add radioactively labeled glycine, so that's an amino acid, glycine is an amino acid, um, which organelle will radioactivity be found first? So basically it's asking what happens to the amino acids once they get taken in by the cell? Where do they go? Well, they're going to be incorporated into the proteins of the cell. And what makes the proteins is the ribosome. So first of all, they will turn up in the ribosomes, and maybe later they turn up in the Golgi as as the proteins get further processed, and then they go everywhere as the as the kind of cell builds new proteins. Okay, question five: What resolution can be achieved with a light microscope? Now, in the mind map video, remember I sort of said that as a rule, practically speaking one micrometer is around about the resolution of a light microscope in the lab setting but under specific well-controlled conditions we can get a bit higher than that so you want to think what is the next what's higher than one micrometer so that's this one c 0 0.2 micrometers uh, is the best answer there this is a bit too low two micrometers and if you want to go a little bit further 
what we would do to get this resolution, instead of using a light microscope like, like we might have used in the lab, you'd use something called oil immersion microscopy. Now, what that means uh, is, I'll draw a little diagram over here, is if we have the, uh, this is me trying to draw a, uh, the lens, and we've got the little lens down here, that's what the kind of microscope lens looks like, and then this is the slide here, and then we have the sort of specimen kind of here under a cover slip like that, okay? There's the cover slip, there's the specimen. So this is the specimen that we would like to observe. So what actually is done is they take a, a drop, let's use a highlighter for this, of a special oil, and the drop basically goes like that. So it means there's no air between the lens and the specimen. And that, because of it, uh, because of the oil's kind of retracted, um, sorry, refractive um, properties, means that you can achieve a higher resolution because the light just goes straight, you know, from the light underneath up through into the lens without traveling through air here. It goes through special oil. Anyway, that's called oil immersion microscopy, a little bit beyond the syllabus. So six, which of the following cell structures does not have an envelope? Remember, an envelope is a double membrane. So which one does not have a double membrane? Well, this one does have a double membrane. This one does, and this one does. That's lysosome A. So those two things, two questions we've seen, question six, which is about double membranes, and also if we scroll back up, question one, which is about DNA, these two things taken together are evidence that both mitochondria and chloroplasts used to be their own free living prokaryotes because they were when they're sort of when they were swallowed up by a larger cell that process of swallowing generated the two membranes and the fact that they've got dna within them also kind of gives us a clue that they kind of used to be able to copy themselves they were free living things so those two things together would be taken as evidence for, write this down if you'd like to, the endosymbiotic theory. On to question seven. So intestinal epithelial cells have an observable brush border. What is this brush border? So if you were to draw an epithelial cell, it kind of look a bit like this. It's got a brush border like that. So what is it? Well, this brush border is uh, microvilli, C. Now, you might have been tempted by this one, A, cilia. Now, cilia can move. So they are found in cells which need to move something. So, for example, in your trachea, you've got ciliated cells that move mucus up, and they kind of beat like this. They carry the mucus up and out. You also find them in the oviduct, where they help to move uh, an egg along the fallopian tube. Uh, but these ones, microvilli, are really just about increasing the surface area. So we can just label that as well. Hi. SA for absorption of uh, food products. All right, on to A, A8. So centrioles are involved in uh, cell division, D. Uh, so when the nucleus uh, is separated, if we sort of, well, actually, they wouldn't really have uh, let's get rid of that, actually. It wouldn't really have a, a, a nuclear envelope because it would have broken down, but at opposite poles of the cell, there is a centriole sort of here and here. And the centriole kind of sends out microtubule uh, filaments or spindle fibers that attach to those chromosomes. Let's put chromosome in a different color. So attached to those chromosomes which get pulled apart. So the centriole is this and it is this here, centriole. And the centriole is an arrangement of uh, microtubules, uh, kind of sort of in this arrangement, kind of a cross of microtubules. Nine, which of the following is responsible for the destruction of damaged organelles? So this one is the lysosome. Uh, so remember I said that the lysosome has a role in autolysis, which is kind of recycling of dead, not dead stuff because it wasn't alive in the first place, but recycling of proteins and things that are kind of worn out a bit uh, and need to be renewed. 10. Which of the following is concerned with the synthesis and transport of lipids and steroids in the cell? Well, that is the smooth ER. That's a fact hopefully you'll just remember. Remember, rough ER is to do with protein synthesis and the smooth ER is to do with lipids and steroids in the cell. I'm not really sure if I clarified what a steroid is in the previous video, so I'm just going to spend a second on that. A steroid 
um, it's a type of structure. Okay, we'll learn a little bit more about this, uh, I think, in year 13. But it's a it's a flat, planar structure. If you do chemistry, it has quite a lot of benzene rings in it. Uh, I'm not going to be able to remember the structure of it off the top of my head, but it kind of looks a bit like this. It's kind of a flat benzene ring structure with various groups off of it, and you know, carbons and hydrogens and whatnot. And basically, it's a it's a type of hormone. So steroid hormones uh, include testosterone and estrogen. Okay, those are the two most common steroid hormones that you need to know about. Uh, and the significance of them being steroid hormones is that they are hydrophobic which means that when they're trying to get into a cell, they basically can just dissolve their way through the phospholipid bilayer. That's a bit of year 13 stuff uh, that we'll look in more detail when we look at hormonal communication in year 13, but I just thought I'd mention it to you now. So that one is B. Okay, halfway through, let's keep pushing on. 11. So for this one, um, whether you've got the right answer is kind of going to be dependent on your printer because uh, I think, and I've done a bit of calculating here, that when you measured this, if you did print this out and you measured this line, W to X, you should have measured it, I think, as it would have been about six centimeters, I think, if it's printed correctly. All right, so how do we work out the actual width? Well, we need to remember this uh, I am triangle. So that stands for image, actual, and magnification. So what we're trying to work out is the uh, the actual size. So the actual is the image divided by the magnification. So therefore, A equals I over M. Uh, the image is 6 centimeters divided by 100. So 6 centimeters divided by 100 is 0 0.06 centimeters. So that's converting that. It would be 0 0.6 millimeters or 600 microns. So that is D, okay? Ah, now this one, I like this one. This is a, about staining. You have to think a little bit about it. So what two macromolecules have been stained? Well, first of all, we can see that there is a kind of a bluish stain in this uh, image, and there's also a kind of a purpley stain in this image, okay? Purpley pink. So what are these two things? Well, the purpley pink, you should identify that it's the nuclei that have been stained. Okay, now what's in nuclei? It's DNA, nucleic acid. So we've, we could be this one, or we could be this one. Um, what about the blue stain? Well, the blue here shows clearly the cell walls. So that's the cell walls, and cell walls are formed of cellulose. So therefore, the answer to this question is C. Some cell walls, later on, you might, actually, if you're looking at plant transport, you might be aware that lignin is used to reinforce some cell walls, but it is specifically in xylem tissue, and you wouldn't find it in all the cells, like in this leaf cross section. Okay, on to question 13. The answer to this one is D, prevents the mitochondria from changing structure. So it basically to make sure that the water potential is the same inside and outside of the mitochondria. Remember, we want to talk about water potential at A level. Um, you could maybe get away in a, an exam question with saying isotonic, but it's better to say that the water potential inside and outside the mitochondria are the same, so there will be no net movement of water via osmosis, so they won't pop or shrivel for that matter. 14, simple one here. What would be found only in a eukaryotic cell, that is a nucleus, is only found in a eukaryotic cell. Remember, eukaryo, if you take that word apart, eu actually means true in Greek, I think, and karyo means nucleus. So they have a true nucleus. That's what the word eukaryotic means. 15, which of the following has the lowest surface area to volume ratio? I like this one. You've got, got to think about it a little bit. So... You need to remember that the smaller the object it is, then it has the largest or larger SA to V ratio. Okay, so small objects have large surface area to volume ratio. So immediately let's cross out the smallest thing. A bacteria is the smallest thing. The next smallest thing is a bacterium. So let's cross that out. Oops, cross that out. So what about a phagocyte versus a red blood cell? They're both um, animal cells. They're both blood cells. How do we know which one's bigger? Well, a phagocyte is a little bit bigger for a start, 
But if you didn't know that, you may remember that a phagocyte is a roughly blobby shape, kind of circular, whereas a red blood cell has specifically is adapted to be biconcave, giving it a high surface area to volume ratio. So the answer is therefore B. Which one of these organelles contains DNA? Question 16. Uh, okay, well, it's this one. It's the mitochondria. Remember, we've talked about the endosymbiotic theory already a few times. So mitochondria have their own DNA always, and they, can, they, they code for some, some genes that are involved in the process of aerobic respiration. That's the function of the mitochondria. 17. Right, I imagine this one may have thrown some of you. It looks terrifying. Uh, it kind of scares me slightly, but it actually is a lot simpler than you might think. All this is about is about this process of centrifugation. Uh, so basically in centrifugation, you have a you know an axis here, you have a little, uh, how am I gonna draw this? You have a little device that spins a kind of test tube that's held like this. And then you have another test tube over here that's held like this. And this thing spins around super, super fast. And the faster it spins, stuff that's in the test tubes kind of sediments down and settles at the bottom. Okay, settles at the bottom. Now, the faster you spin, the, the smaller things you can push down to the bottom using kind of gravity. Um, so what that means is that big stuff gets sedimented out first and small stuff gets sedimented out last. Okay, so we're looking at big to small from fraction one to fraction four. So really, that's what, what you need to do down here. What what which row goes big to small? So what's the biggest thing in a cell? Well, it's the nucleus, okay? So already we're, we've eliminated two. What's the next biggest thing in a cell? It's definitely not ribosomes, it is the mitochondria, so it's this one, the answer is C. Going from big to not so big, to lysosomes to ribosomes. Nuclei, maybe up to five micro, micrometers across. Mitochondria, about one micrometer. Lysosomes, ooh, I don't know pretty small, maybe 0.1 micrometers or 0.2 or something like that, and ribosomes are really tiny in the nanometer range. Okay, on to 18. So single membrane versus double. Single membrane, uh, tonoplast, yes. Lysosome, yes, single membrane. Two membranes, nucleus, yes, it's got two. Chloroplast, yes, it's got two. So straight away, it's A. If you work through the other ones, you'd see there'd be some mistakes here. So for example, chloroplast has got two, and yeah, so the answer is A. Which of the following would be found in an animal cell undergoing mitosis, but not in a plant cell undergoing mitosis? The answer is centriole, B. Uh, I actually cannot remember what takes the role of a centriole in a uh, plant cell mitosis, someone look it up, uh, message me on Teams, remind me what it is, I can't remember, but in animal cells we have centrioles, in plant cells I think there's something slightly different that generates those spindle fibres and pulls the chromosomes apart. Subtle difference in mitosis. Right, we've made it to the last question, 20. Which of the following is absent from prokaryotic cells? Well, prokaryotic cells do have plasmids, remember there's a circular loop of DNA that carries a gene. Cell wall, yes they do, made of uh, peptidoglycan, not cellulose. Rough endoplasmic reticulum, they do not have that, and ribosomes, of course they do, they have to make proteins. So the answer is therefore C. All right, so uh, hope that was helpful uh, and clarified any questions that you got wrong. Uh, mark it out of 20 uh, and send me a picture of your completed uh, test on Teams, put it onto the assignment page please. Uh, and then the next lesson that I'm going to post will be another mind map, uh, and that'll be on biological molecules, okay? And then there'll be another one of these multiple choice tests. Okay, thanks very much. Bye-bye.